Good morning, students. I trust that you are well and keeping safe. Yeah, I'm delighted this morning to welcome you to our class today um, on the unit uh, BJL 3119, Gender, Culture, and Communication. And in uh, the class today, we are going to discuss the concept of uh, gendered communication. And specifically, we are going to be um, interested in theorizing and exploring whether there are differences between how men and women communicate in the society and what does avail available academic literature inform us about uh, this concept. But before we you know, um, go into the details of uh, gendered communication, it is important for us to you know, build some foundation on uh, the concept of uh, human communication because um, it is human communication that gives rise to the concept of uh, gendered communication. And human communication um, has been um, or uh, falls within the umbrella of uh, the discipline of uh, communication that is called uh, anthroposemiotics that is uh, basically involved with understanding how people communicate in the society, how they use symbols and signs, and uh, how they appropriate these uh, symbols and signs in their everyday um, life to make meaning and to make interpretations, what is called uh, the symbolic communication. So human communication itself um, involves any uh, verbal and non-verbal kind of sending of signals um, from one person to another. And this uh, can be categorized into uh, various forms such as oral communication, um, written communication, gestured or signed uh, information that is produced by one person and received by another on the other end. And it involves the use of language, and language in itself is uh, the use of symbolic codes to pass across messages, and received through systems such as visuals, uh, auditory, uh, tactile. And these are generated through a person's voice, speech, writing, manual, and again, uh, signs and gestures. So basically, that's the academic definition of what um, we would call human communication. Human communication has been misunderstood. And as communication scholars and as senior students at the university, it is our duty to try to bust some of these myths that uh, surround um, the notion of human communication. And I have highlighted a couple of these myths um, that, uh, that, that, that are passed along in the society when it comes to communication. And one of these myths is the more you communicate, the better your communication will be. And this is a myth because um, one needs to learn the right habits of communication so that they can become an effective communicator. And it is not an um, issue of the frequency or the length of your communication. Another thing here that we need to understand, and we shall speak um, in depth about it, is the idea of uh, when two people are in a close relationship, neither person should have to communicate uh, their needs and wants explicitly. The other person should know what these are and um, evidence uh, around the study of human communication is showing that this is a myth, um, that if you want to communicate effectively, you should always make explicit your needs and um, your wants to the people that you're communicating with. Another myth here is surrounding the idea of conflict in communication, and we try to ask ourselves, can we avoid conflict in the process of human communication? And the myth has been that um, interpersonal or group conflict 
is a reliable sign that uh, the relationship or group is in trouble. And clearly, um, a lot of research around human communication has shown that conflict itself is inevitable whenever human beings come together and <coughs> they are engaged in the process of communication. So therefore, conflict is a part and parcel of human communication that should be seen as that and not to be avoided, but to, you know, for people to work around uh, ways of resolving it. And we shall look at, uh, towards the end of the lesson, um, what are some of the proposed ways that uh, then if um, in gendered communication, male and female communicate differently, how can we resolve this kind of conflict? Another myth here is uh, some people are better communicators than others, and that is true, but um, good communicators are not born. But it is through practice and applying the right principles uh, in the process of communication, one becomes proficient communicator. It is not about um, having innate uh, capacities. Every, every human being has got this capacity to become a good communicator. And in the coming slide, we shall look at what are some of the key skills that are required in the process of human communication and how this uh, then fits into the notion of gendered communication and the differences that emerge um, between how men and uh, women communicate in the society. Then there is this idea of um, the fear of speaking in public. Um, some people think um, some other people are more gifted when it comes to speaking in public than others. But the truth of the matter is the fear of speaking in public is a normal thing and that um, almost every other speaker is always nervous when they stand before a stage to articulate their ideas. So one is not going to learn from a book how to eliminate what you call stage fright, um, but you can manage this fear by making it work for you rather than making it work against you. Um, and the last of... Um, well, I, I think I've exhausted those uh, myths. So let me explore some of the principles of human communication, the principles that underpin the concept of the human communication. And the first to look at here is the idea of motivation, that um, human communication in itself is purposive, that uh, whether we are communicating um, by by verbal or through non-verbal cues, every communication has motivation. And even, one, even when that motivation is not um, explicitly um, stated, it is there that uh, there is a purpose to, to that communication. And it is a process, meaning that no messages occur in isolation. Every communication is interconnected and it is a continuous loop that is always happening as uh, human beings are interacting with each other in the society, meaning that this process does not stop. Even when we are not speaking, we are still communicating, just like we have seen um, at the initial definition of what constitutes um, human communication. The process and the event will mean that one looks at more than just the outcome. So the responses that you get from uh, the recipients of the messages should not be seen to be the end of the process of communication because then we will have a shallow understanding of what human con communication really constitutes, that it is an ongoing process. And the fact that um, you know, physically or um, uh, within our understanding when you send a message to someone and they respond to you, that might be seen to be the end of the communication process. As long as human beings are in the society, that process is infinite. Human communication involves choices and this means that we are always confronted with what to say 
uh, and what not to say. And communication training enlarges the number of our choices. And um, this has got to do with also the idea of emotional intelligence, uh, what words, um, what bodily uh, language to communicate. So if you are more versant with communica communication skills, you have a wider array of options through which you can communicate uh, your message in a purposive manner. And in itself, human communication is prone to different interpretations, what you call ambiguity, uh, meaning that uh, context becomes very important for us to uh, tease out the meaning of what it is uh, that um, the speaker is saying. Uh, what uh, context here speaks to is the fact that um, we could be using everyday language uh, to talk to people, but there is what you call code switching, that uh, you could switch um, the meanings or the, the, the interpretation of the codes of that language to give a different interpretation that can only be understood by certain groups of the society. And think about something like Sheng, you know, a uh, language that has evolved over time in Kenya, uh, you know, fusing uh, some words from Swahili and English and probably some uh, native uh, tongues around. That becomes very uh, problematic for conventional understanding because of the idea of code switching. I've already spoken to the idea of symbolic interaction that, uh, you know, language in itself uses symbols uh, and through those symbols uh, they, they connote uh, certain ideas and then we are able to make meaning out of uh, those symbols that uh, are constructed in the process of communication. A very important principle here that uh, human communication is unavoidable. Um, and this is because any behavior is a form of communication, just like we've seen before, um, that we should be aware we are making communication, even when we are not telling people uh, that we are in that, engaged in that particular process. Uh, you know, something that is profoundly um, so, um, insightful, because every interaction then becomes communication. And a lot of scholarship trying to understand then what is the process of communication. Um, there is the idea that communication then can become anything. Even the idea of being silent or the idea of not saying anything in itself becomes communication. And as we shall see, um, there are certain genders um, or that this kind of uh, non-verbal cues are more associated with certain gender than uh, a different one. Again, it is contextual. I think I've said the idea of context already as I was trying to explain ambiguity. And context here is very important again because of what you call structural influences and understanding um, shared meanings. And shared meanings are among groups of people in the society. Um, how certain people have or appropriate meaning to one uh, sign or a signal of the language that is being used uh, could be significantly different from how it's being appropriated by a different group altogether. So the idea of context becomes very important. And then uh, the notions of content, relationship, and power come to play, that there's a power dimension uh, when um, human beings are communicating. And this is uh, manifested in different ways. Uh, power could be the idea of persuasion, when someone is trying to um, lobby or to sell uh, certain ideas across to either one person or to a group of people. So they hold some kind of power in the way they use communication um, and the words that they use. Then. Even uh, non-verbal dimensions of um, communication have a relationship with power dynamics in the society. Um, if you look at the idea of reference power and legitimate or coercive power or expert power, you know, uh, all these try to appropriate um, the process of communication or the tools of communication 
to legitimize the power dimension in the process of communication. It is a two-way process, of course, uh, meaning that uh, uh, there is the idea of uh, back and forth between the parties that are involved in uh, the communication. And it is punctuated. Um, you know, it's not continuous, that there is the idea of causes and effects, um, the idea of part and whole, and the whole becoming a part and the part becoming a whole, meaning that, you know, these continuous loops uh, that are interconnected that make communication are, you know, um, a series of events that ultimately boil down to what we uh, refer to as human communication. This is a very important principle of uh, human communication, that it is irreversible and unrepeatable. And what this means is that messages are always being sent, always unique, one-time occurrences, and they cannot be duplicated. And the importance of this is um, to appreciate the fact that once you send out communication as a human being, you cannot reverse that kind of communication. So think about um, the times when probably we um, utter insightful words or utter words that uh, injure people's feelings. You know, those words cannot be reversed. Once you've said them, you know, they've already been published and there is no way you can take them back. No matter how many apologies, for instance, you offer someone that you've already offended, you know, the original words that you've already said cannot be taken back. And also that applies to, you know, if it's messages of encouragement, positive messages, and so on. So that's a very important principle there, that uh, these messages are irreversible and unrepeatable. And that's a significant difference um, between human communication and mediated communication. Because mediated communication, you know, uh, this is communication that is through the channels of mass media. So we are talking about, let's say, the TV or radio or newspapers. These words can be reversed or they can be unrepeated. If we can use that phrase. But if you think about human communication, once a person has said it, it cannot be taken back. It's already out there. Um, it has a unique quality to itself, and it's a one-time occurrence that has already happened and cannot be repeated. So what are the kind of skills that uh, are deemed uh, essential when we are talking about uh, human communication? And one of those skills is presentation skills. Um, and these presentation skills enable one to be confident. And presentation skills are not just about um, how you prepare the presentation itself, the choice of words that you use, but also the entire ecology of the communication process. The person's demeanor, the body language, the context and everything all constitute self-presentation. Then uh, relationship skills are very important in the process of communication. As we shall see towards the end of this lesson, there is uh, something that is um, a concept that is called um, gen gender intelligence, you know, trying to build a kind of understanding or kind of intelligence on how to relate with different people so that you can achieve different ends. And uh, that goes to do with uh, relationships. Interviewing skills enable us to gain information from other people and we do this through how we ask questions and how we interact in the process of asking those um, questions and trying to gain information. Therefore, you need to also develop those kind of skills. And then um, group interaction and leadership skills uh, is another essential human skill that is very important because as human beings, uh, we don't live in isolation. We live with and among other people. Uh, we live in groups and groups become dynamic. Um, the, I mean, groups have very, um, what you call group dynamics, become very challenging um, sometimes to achieve an end. And uh, this is important skill so that uh, if 
for instance, uh, you are doing an assignment with other students, you are able to do that assignment in a manner that is productive and not counter uh, productive. So group interaction skills becomes important and leadership skills again, uh, speaking to the idea of human communication. If you have been asked to lead a team of other uh, members of the society, then communication becomes the vehicle through which you are able to share your ideas of leadership and so on. Then the, the last one, and that is related also to leadership skills, is uh, the idea of public speaking skills, which I spoke to earlier. And I say that you know it's a it's an it's a concept uh, or it's um, it's an art and craft that is developed over time, and not necessarily um, one that people have innately. Um, so, as we look at uh, gendered communication, it's important to understand um, a, a concept of uh, interpersonal communication, which really speaks to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That um, Maslow's theory uh, postulates that uh, human beings use communication to meet their needs. And um, if you remember how the Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, uh, cascades, certain needs have higher premium or there are lower needs uh, than other um, needs which are called high needs. So it's important to understand how communication then is used in the process of understanding and trying to meet the needs uh, of uh, human beings through the process of interpersonal communication. And um, some of the factors here to consider include um, how we regard ourselves as communicators, um, our listening skills, and I was able to put listening uh, skills with uh, fake listening, uh, meaning that uh, someone can be hearing what you're saying, but they're not necessarily uh, making sense or trying to process what is it that uh, you are uh, talking about the idea of fake listening. And empathy is when uh, a listener is able to put themselves into the shoes or into the context of the speaker and they empathize with them. And assertiveness is a character of uh, the speaker themselves being able to project the ideas and being able to communicate uh, in a manner that uh, penetrates uh, the other end of uh, the communication. And all this really speaks to the communication competencies of uh, different human beings. So when we are discussing the idea of gender and communication, there are some important things that we need to uh, clarify. And one of these is the notion of sex and gender. That these two things um, are, are different and uh, the differences are important in trying to understand then how they appropriate communication within their particular context. And when you're discussing the notion between um, uh, the differences between sex and gender, first is the understanding that gender, um, but uh, let me begin with sex and not gender, is that sex is something that we cannot change. Um, a person's sex is uh, their biological and physiological characteristics that define who they are as men or women. So being a man is something that we are born with. Or being a woman is something that we are born with. You know those biological and physiological characteristics that uh, make a man or that make a woman. But when you think about gender, Gender is what we call social constructive, uh, is, is, is a socially constructed concept. And it is considered to be socially constructed because it is society that um, gives us meaning or gives meaning to the notion of gender. So when someone is born um, as a man or as a woman, they are not really aware at the point of their birth what is their gender. But as a person grows, as a person um, 
interacts with other people, with their immediate family, with um, their immediate outer family in terms of the society, their gender starts to be constructed by that immediate society. And once uh, people start telling you uh, things like, um, boys don't do that, um, girls don't do those things, or, you know, these are the roles that are assigned to women, or these are the roles that are assigned to boys, then society begins to channel men and women into certain uh, pipes that constitute then what is their gender, what are their gender roles, and what functions and um, roles are assigned to those uh, genders. But interestingly, um, a concept that has been uh, developing over time is the idea of queer identity. And queer identity as a concept itself in the academy and in the society has been growing since the 1990s, since um, uh, it was first coined by this communication scholar called uh, Teresa, Teresa. And queer really refers to um, that defiance of existing notions of gender and trying to come up with a different um, disruptive thinking around what are the gender roles and what is male and what is female. And it seeks to challenge the categories of sexuality and identity that has already been constructed socially by the society and create and 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 uh, that that construction is created in discourse rather than essential biological categories and primarily these discussions around queer identity are centered on uh, the gay and lesbian communities uh, within the society and um, other people who don't necessarily uh, attribute or um, regard themselves to be either male or female and increasingly, um, queer is being mainstreamed uh, even into um, official documents. Uh, people sometimes are being asked, uh, are you male, are you female? And then there's another category that is being added there that is called Arthur. And you know, Arthur is trying to take care of the fact that uh, people do not really identify with are uh, those mainstream gender roles of um, male and female, and there's a kind of defiance that is already existing. So like I've already articulated here, is that then gender is a socially constructed role, uh, behavior, activity, and attributes that are given by society in the process of socialization, or what you call social construction. And these are appropriated to or for men and women. So um, then the male gender gives rise to the category that is called the masculine. And then the female gender gives rise to the category that is called uh, the feminine. So in communication, are there certain differences then that come about as a result of you know, these differences of gender <coughs> between uh, uh, between members of the society. So let's see what literature is saying in terms of the differences. Is that when it comes to verbal communication based on the um, differences on gender, I was able to articulate uh, at least this one, two, three, four, um, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, differences that uh, try to uh, uh, manifest in the process of our communication verbally. And one of these is uh, Men, in the masculine category, try to avoid personal stories. So men don't like to talk about their, their personal stories. But women, on the other hand, uh, which fall under the feminine category, they share personal stories and they offer those personal stories. That's a key difference that is emerging from research around this, um, around this gender communication. Another difference is that uh, when men are speaking, they attempt to dominate the conversation. 
And this is a significant difference from uh, when women or uh, the feminine category are speaking. They are concerned with equalized input as opposed to dominance. And here, they will form groups, meaning that they want to spread uh, or equalize uh, that, that uh, communication process uh, if it were to be seen as power. Uh, power relations are distributed across groups, but this one is power, um, power dynamics being centered around one person, the idea of dominance. Men are less likely to listen, while women listen carefully and attenti attentively. Um, another significant difference there. And um, also men under the masculine, uh, they tend to be more aggressive and more prone to interrupt in the process of uh, communication. But women, on the other hand, uh, allow themselves to be interrupted more and they are less aggressive in the process of verbal communication. So then can we see some differences around uh, non-verbal communication differences that are based on gender? Um, so if we look at the idea of uh, body language, which is what speaks to uh, non-verbal communication differences that are based on gender, uh, body language for men, that means facial expression. Men don't use a lot of facial expression, so they use less of that in terms of body language but women tend to use more of that um, in terms of facial expression. Eye contact, men tend to avoid eye contact, but women tend to prefer eye contact. So that's another difference in terms of body language. And posture, uh, when men are speaking, they tend to be more relaxed. But when women are, are speaking, they tend to be more tense. And then again, um, bodily proximity, which is also connected to the idea of touch. Uh, body language of body proximity, men tend to be, um, to have less or to, um, to exceed less of this um, language. But women um, have a closer bodily proximity, um, which then again is related to touching that the interpretation of bodily language of touch for men is of sexual interest. But for women, uh, the connotation of touch means warmth and <coughs> friendship or relationship as opposed to sexual interest in men. And a lot of research around this, um, you know, uh, which is really going into the uh, the province of uh, psychology and psychology of communication is showing that these differences emanate from uh, the structure of our brain, that our brains are significantly structured different across the genders or across uh, the sexes at this point because now um, we are talking about the physiological and the biological constitution of uh, human beings. So the brain structure of a man and a woman has been found to be different. And this difference is that most of the men's activities are dominated by the left brain, while most of the women's activities are dominated by the right brain. And so really what happens in the left and the, uh, in the, left and the right brain? Um, the left brain, which really dominates the activities of men, is uh, dominated by um, functions that are related to analytic thought and logic and language and science and math, you know, which could be seen as very, very uh, analytic and usability kind of experiences. But if you look at how the right brain then functions, which dominates the activities of women, there is the idea of holistic thought and intuition, creativity, art, and music. And these categories can further be seen in this uh, illustration here. Then those functionalities give um, rise to different articulations of the same. 
So you're talking about logic for men, you know, symbolic order, rationality, linear coherency, target and direction, systematic ana an analysis of uh, uh, human experiences. But if you look at this colorful then uh, bright, uh, bright side of the brain of, of that dominates the experiences of ladies or women, um, you know, it's full of color, creativity, um, imagination, dream, surreal, novel, random and free, uh, big picture, music, art, among others. And then this uh, starts to explain then how that process of socialization is, um, is, is, is effected or is achieved within the society such that how he or she is brought up then constitutes that uh, idea of social construction. So if you think about this example here, that a man who grew up with three sisters was therefore influenced by a culture of females against a man who grew up with brothers and sisters and lived in a diverse neighborhood. So there are certain, uh, and a lot of research, especially in the psychology of communication here, is trying to understand that notion of social construction. You know, when a man, when a boy is brought up by a single mother, um, or when a boy is brought up or grows up in, in a context of um, a lot of sisters, as opposed to a diverse group, how is that person then socialized, uh, socially constructed? their idea of communication, how does it manifest? <clears throat> so society has got certain stereotypes that exist um, regarding this communication, and this is what I was talking about, the notion of gendered communication. And these stereotypes really border on the differences that we saw earlier uh, in terms of verbal and non-verbal communication for men and women. And for male and female stereotypes, the female stereotypes here are around that women uh, try to create rapport uh, in the process of communication. They express supportiveness, they build relationships, they ask questions, they cooperate. You know, they are holistic and they seek consensus and relate um, within the group dynamics. But the stereotypes for men is that instead of creating rapport, they report and reporting as a relationship with dominance and the notion of individuality. They avoid questions while women ask those questions. Uh, men are assertive in their communication. They are more focused in uh, their needs and articulation of the same. And uh, also the notion of giving orders associated with dominance. Uh, giving orders becomes um, relevant there. And they tend to resolve um, they, they tend to use language or communication that is meant to resolve, and this one is meant to relate. Further articulation of these stereotypes in a general way is captured in this, um, in this, in this um, um, illustration again, uh, which shows that men <coughs> tend to have the stereotypes around the idea of logic, you know, the reasoning that one thing must lead to another cause and effect. But women are associated with feelings. Feelings tend to be of the affective domain of the human beings. This tends to be the logic, um, cognitive, the logical cognitive portion, which is involved with reason and um, attributing things to you know, causes and effect as opposed to affective nature of uh, feelings. Then uh, men have a notion of power, power dominance directing in language. Uh, women tend to distribute the same. Um, instead of centering it, they distribute it into groups, uh, sharing it. Men have the notion of winning uh, in their language and or communication. Women have an idea of closeness and warmth and uh, relationship. Men are more independent in the communication process, and uh, women tend to be a bit intimate in the communication process. Uh, men tend to be competitive. Women tend to be 
relational. So how can we really understand these uh, differences? And how can we then foster uh, good and healthy communication ecology in the society if we are to approach uh, these gender differences in a more uh, positive way, a way that would bring society and human communication closer and better than separators and um, make communication a difficult process. So um, a few things to be said on that is uh, we need to have a balanced approach when we are talking about the idea of gendered communication. And uh, a couple of points here to note is one, we need to understand the motivation behind a person's behavior when they are, uh, they are making a communication. And we have spoken about motivation when we started. We say that uh, all human communication is purposive. It is motivated, uh, meaning that even if we don't see that motive <coughs> um, uh, or that motive is not manifest directly, it is still there. Then we also need to recognize the communication style and the biases. So we need to be aware of the gendered differences that emerge in the process of the communication. And we need to be respectful, respectful and open to other person's communication style and values. Um, and finally, we need to work on a compromise to bring out the strengths of the communication style. And I want to close this lesson by reading a quote from a gentleman called um, John Gray. And John Gray has written a book that is called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And what he says is that if you are looking at conflict because of the gender differences between men and women, the real issue is lack of gender intelligence, you know, that understanding, that intelligence that uh, <coughs> arises from the fact that you understand how different communication um, in men is significantly so from um, uh, the communication in women. So that is what we're calling gender intelligence. And Gray therefore recommends that we need to appreciate and respect the differences between men and women to anticipate them, those differences, and then respond appropriately to those differences. So students, um, this is where I wish to put a stop to our lesson today for the class on uh, um, gender culture and communication, um, BJL 3119, where we've been able to discuss the idea of gendered communication, trying to articulate the differences between um, how women and men communicate in the society. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Keep safe. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.